When working with a new mic controller, I always like to start with the basics and ensure things are working as they are. Things like switching on an LED and reading the ADC. Here we are simply switching on and off a GPIO port looking at how it interfaces. When starting development, it's always helpful to look at the documentation provided by the manufacturer. I'm showing you how I got these pieces of code and how I've formed it up and how you can teach yourself along the way and not just copying blindly. Something I've always struggled with and now we're starting this new Bluetooth speaker project. I'll show you how the development works and goes on behind it. So I'll put this all in the description, but there is a lot here that they've provided by the Expressive the manufacturer the website on the header files so the, the application layer that you can use to configure your code and get easy things to to look up and configure it's so much more easier think of this as the stm32 how layer in fact it is it is it, it is the hardware abstraction layer and this is what we're using to configure these things coming back to the code i'm going to slowly walk through it onto what i've done to get a little bit of base oversight into it let's pay attention to the header files we have included first in most cases the manufacturer will provide some drivers in which we can easily use an interface with the outside world with. So if you notice in the documentation, this header file was shown here, and this is how we would include it in our own piece of code. Coming back to here, I have included this piece, and you've noticed that I've included these two more, free RTOS, and you've probably heard of it by now, but it stands for real-time operating system. And this is, well, this was developed for microcontrollers, and this is really helpful when we have a lot of things going on, like sensors, wireless comms, processing data, and all sorts of things going on in the background, and you only need it to work simultaneously. It's quite nifty, though this is a beast within the topic in itself, and I'll be covering it later on in a more in-depth guide into what is it, and to showcase what we can actually do with it and understand it, and to understand it better. But for now, let's get into the GPIO part. So it helps if with a bit reading first and how into how these things work. So if you look at the, the data sheet into the registers and everything, you realize that we have some bits to set and whatnot. And this we can set the direction. Do we want it as a pull up? Things like that. So that being said, we must figure the direction first of our GPIO. What GPIO are we using? What do we want, input or output? Going back to the documentation, we're going to have a scroll through and read for what we're looking for to set the direction of a GPIO pin. Here we go. So we found going through here, we found GPIO set direction, configure GPIO direction, such as output only, input only, output and input. And we have some returns, what we can do with it and the parameters set. So these are the input, what we need to do. So it gives some good examples here that the GPIO num, num t, is should be GPIO number if you want to set direction if eg so for example GPIO 16 GPIO num should be GPIO num 16 which will configure to GPIO pin number 16 if you're still unsure of this you can actually just control click this and you're brought into the inside to what it goes on with it and we can select this and we can see itself what what could we input itself into so what what's the value we could place in in that value as well we can also see the gpi mode direction so again if we go here we're not too sure what gpi mode we can see here what are the input values it will accept and as well the comments to what is it so for our case we will need a gpi mode output so we're going to use this and this is gpi mode output only and this is what we're doing here coming back to this we will have a while loop just to sort of think he's repeating itself a piece of code this will only execute once and we're going to set the level to high again same same kind of concept you can read here you see what level so output level zero one high so this will high we have put a little delay there so we can see the transition and let things process and we're going to switch it off again. So after all that, we've understood it. And again, refer to the documentation for anything you do not understand. And this will be really helpful. All it takes is a bit of reading trial and error. We're going to click build, flash, and monitor. It's going to take a while. So I built it before, so it's just, just flashing the device. And if you can see here, we have our code running. We're going to move on to the ADC now. Here in the ADC version, we're going to walk that through now. And I found it a bit more difficult to configure than with the STM32. I think there's a bit more to look into and read and such but we got there. And again, all this was available in the documentation. So if I switch over, if I switch over to here, we're in the expressive analog to digital converter, ADC peripherals. It's giving us a bunch of readings into what pins were, are actually being used. For ADC one, ADC two, the attenuation. Th this is a quite important one, which I'll get into, but just recall this here, the conversion. So what's the command we need to get, uh, the limitations, driver usage, what we can do. As you can see here, the it's quite sensitive to noise and it's not all the best. So it, it gives some values with it. I haven't put a capacitor in mind, but we'll get to that. So there's quite a lot here. Just take a read through and it's what I've based this code off of. So again, I've included all the drivers that are that are needed. As, uh, some other ones like the ESP log to error check, 
some extra ones I've added in. Of course, this is all in the documentation again. Have a search through for what you need. There's even example products that you can use. And we're going to step through this. So I think it's best to start off here. When you look into setting up the ADC, this is just a simple reading type thing. Like we just want to know a value of what the data is coming in. So we got to characterize this and this is the first step we want to know it's going to ask us for characterize an adc at a particular attenuation this function will characterize the adc at a particular attenuation generate the adc voltage curve in the form of this formula we base on two point values e field re ref and such it gives us the parameters into what we need to are we using adc1 or adc2 we have selected adc1 attenuation to characterize if you recall to that brief little table there I've selected ADC at 10 years dB11 so we can get a higher range of readings. So keep that in mind. Bit width is the resolution. Default ADC reference voltage. So this will be the standard. And we need to have a point to empty structure to store these, these characteristics. It's why we have one here. We have set one up here. We have some error checks to ensure that we are getting the right values and this will pop up. So if anything wrong, any of those in if you do not want to error check or whatever. So that's fine. You can leave that out and you're, it will still work as fine, it just depends. You, we usually put these in to make things more robust and to detect and help with what errors may pop up. There is a documentation here where we can read about error handling, what we can do about it, and it's a bit more information. I'll put this in. I think it's quite a little bit of interesting read to know that this exists and what we can do. So once we've characterized that, it's simple. It's simply as putting in our get raw value. So this is the actual function to how we can read the channel and just printing out this value here. So again, we're gonna build and flash and monitor this. Uh, for this application, I was really gonna look into just setting it up as a simple battery monitor really without getting too expensive on things. So I've had my power supply turned off. So I said raw ADC equals zero. I'm gonna turn it on. It's at 1.2 volts, it's reading 1,400. So you can see it's quite noisy, it's quite a bit off. Um, I assume with the capacitor, if we put one in, we'll get a better reading, but it is notoriously known that the ADC on the SP32 is not the best, at least to say. So if you need some really, if you need some high precision or something, or you want a more accurate reading, you can get separate ADC chips that can do it. You can configure it that way. But of course, for this purpose, I'm I'm just going to try and read battery voltage. So I'm not really too bothered about it. So I turned off my power supply. You can see it's it's going down, down. So it's still a bit of noise in it. And we're at zero now. So the next step of this was to combine these two together, the GPIO and the ADC, to get a simple LED on when something is less than a thousand, for example, as a battery simulation. So if the battery voltage reads below a thousand, which we won't, we'll have a cutoff at something else because we're aiming to use a lithium lipo or a lithium ion, and then we'll turn on the LED as an indication saying the battery is low. So I'm back here now. I'm just going to start working on the brief level of code and to get all this running up. So I've just put into notepad here just to, as a reference to copy and paste some stuff over and we'll generate a little bit of a code snippet. Alright, so after a few bits of tinkering around, we have got it to do what we want. So when the so when I was reading 2500, if I lower it down to 1, we can still see it's reading. And I want to lower it down a bit more. A bit more until it triggers it. It should trigger it now. And when the LED comes on. And we're getting a battery low printf on it. Had to include this again so it can read while while it's in the loop, or else it's gonna be permanently stuck. So right now the battery is on because it is less than a thousand that it's reading. We're gonna increase it, and the battery is turned off because we are reading something else now. And if we go back down, LED turns back on. That's just a brief update on to what has been happening with the development. Just wanted to get these two out the way. I think we're going to look into more of an I squared C, the SPI communication to get that set up with some sensors 
to ensure we have something that's working. And then we're going to look into, once I've ordered the parts, look into I2S and setting up that to get some audio readings and actually make a speaker of some sort.